Um, I'm Professor Jen Burndell and welcome to another Deep Adaptation Q&A. This month, my guest is uh, Sean Kelly. He's a professor of philosophy, cosmology and consciousness at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He's author of a book called Coming Home, The Birth and Transformation of the Planetary Era, and more recently has written a couple of books, one on hope and one on planetary initiation, which I hope we're going to hear about. Uh, Sean, I don't know if you know this, Sean, you were the first person to reach out to me after the Deep Adaptation paper came out. So it came out at the end of July 2018, and you wrote to me early August, I think. Um, and yeah, I really appreciated that because immediately you were inviting me into conversations about the, 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 the deepest questions that this outlook, uh, this realization meant. And, and I was very much in a, in a, a place of, um, some people might call it spiritual transformation, but there was a lot of, a lot of angst and a lot of confusion. Uh, and it was wonderful when, when you reached out. So, Sean, thank you for joining us this morning from California. Uh, thank Quite you. Early where you are. Oh, well, it's yeah, it's lovely. The, the, the first light has just uh, has just broken through and with some long uh, awaited rain. It probably won't be very much, but it's it's auspicious for our call. Um, yeah, I actually right before our call, I, I searched my uh, sent folder for that first email to you. I, I was trying to, to remember when it was exactly, and it was in uh, actually in January, sorry, July, uh, yeah, July sure. of 2018. And um, <clears throat> I had no idea I was the first, but I, I remember so well being uh, struck by your paper and feeling this, this inner prompting to reach out to you um, in gratitude and solidarity and, <clears throat> You know, I, I thought it was such a courageous thing for you to to do at the time, uh, and I immediately recognized you as a uh, as a well as a brother and a colleague. I thought, at least, and and my intuition was confirmed by how you graciously responded to me. And the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, and it was clear from that email I received from you that you had already done a lot of your own work in looking at this and going deep into what it might mean for humanity to have destroyed the biosphere as we have and to be facing such a terrible future. Um, and so you were, it was clear that you were drawing on um, spiritual philosophies and practices that, um, to help you with that. And that was really what resonated with me. I, I needed to have those kinds of conversations then and, and still do. So yeah. I suppose my first question would be for you would be, um, uh, how, wh what is your, your philosophy spiritually and how, how, and your practices and how is that helping for you to stay present to the full emotional pain, the full confusing turbulence that we're seeing already and that we know is going to get worse mm. yeah well <clears throat> i guess there are, there are several strands of what could be called my you know my spiritual life my spiritual practice i i was raised uh, uh, a catholic and uh although i you know, fell away from the church at puberty uh coinciding with my initiation into uh, psychedelics uh, at age 13. Um, so that was, you know, opened up a whole other area of direct experience of, of uh, non-ordinary states of consciousness and uh, particularly the immediate experience of uh, the world as alive that uh, in fact, there is no, no such thing as empty space. Every, every particle and every space between the particle is somehow uh, alive and uh, charged and radiant with, um, with spirit. So I had that direct experience uh, as a teenager and um, I had had other experiences, um, I guess going back to the death of my father at seven of uh, just an immediate uh, intuitive certainty about um, the soul, you might say. <clears throat> but um, then of course, you know, I, I also became an adult embedded in a culture where uh, spirit 
is, is a non-entity uh, where the only thing that matters is money, power, money and power basically. And um, you know, so, uh, but um, so the Christian symbols remained important for me, particularly the idea of uh, God or the divine present in the historical process, that there is some kind of, uh, that the whole story, the cosmos as a whole is being held by the divine in some way. So that stayed meaningful to me. But then Buddhism uh, in particular, I was introduced to Buddhism and uh, that has become an essential strand of my spiritual DNA as well uh, through its um, analysis of, the, of our predicament in terms of the universality of suffering, the causes of suffering, the three poisons of, of delusion or ignorance and hate and greed and so on, but also its uh, root teaching of interbeing and of uh, the uh, fluid uh, integral nature of, of, uh, of our reality, which has been very sustaining for me. So those are the main strands, I guess, uh, as well as a, a daily Qigong meditation practice. Um, but you know, the, the real basis of it though uh, is, um, is so much simpler because I, I, I remember when I was hospitalized for a, kidney operation uh, for kidney stone once many years ago, 30 years ago, in such intense pain for, for days and days. All of the spiritual traditions uh, in that most intense pain sort of fell away. And um, the only thing that mattered was that uh, there was somebody that came to see me, uh, even though I couldn't stand their presence for very long because it was too painful, but the simple fact of knowing that somebody loved me and that there was love uh, it taunt on me in that moment was the only thing that really mattered in the sense that the simple fact of love or the possibility of love. So that has remained the bedrock uh, and everything else is, is, uh, is a gift as well, but in the way of elaboration. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, uh, thank you for that reminder, of course, because we can all talk about religions and ancient wisdoms and various practices but but it's it's important to tune into the fact it's it's about love um, the reason i'm asking you about this is because some people think there's going to be a spiritual renaissance as more people feel like these are somewhat apocalyptic times um, and some people point to that almost like the silver lining of collapse of industrial civilization that we're going to wake up um, from those delusions um, but I'm wondering do you think that's likely and what might help with that but also what could be going wrong with that kind of um, re renaissance in times that feel apocalyptic to some people mm. Yeah, um, well, several, many people, several scholars, for instance, in, in my area of religious studies and <clears throat> uh, comparative philosophy have said that we're, we, we have for a while now been uh, witnessing a second axial age, so-called. I mean, the first axial age about 2,500 years ago was when all the great world religions and uh, Western philosophy uh, was born when you know, the Buddha and uh, Mahavira and Lao Tzu and Confucius uh, and so on, Socrates, Plato, they all popped up basically within a century of each other, not knowing of each other's existence. And that gave birth to the main world uh, religious traditions. Well, we seem to be in a second axial age now. Uh, but the difference between the first and the second is that we sort of have the possibility of knowing now that there's a planetary transformation going on. Uh, and that knowledge actually is essential to that knowledge is that this new awakening is a planetary awakening, that we have become conscious in a way that we could never have become conscious before, that we share a common origin, we share a common destiny as children, as it were, uh, of Gaia, of Earth, this, this living planet, uh, that is part of a uh, you know, 13.6 billion year ongoing evolutionary mystery. 
So um, this is the second axial age, but as you say, it's happening in paradoxically in the context of um, seemingly imminent collapse and uh, the unraveling of complex life itself, which um, is contributing to this spiritual rebirth, but as you know, is also uh, creating opportunities for further delusion and, and panic and uh, hatred and, and the three poisons. So um, I, I, th I think they're, they're all arising together and, and perhaps um, that's not an accident, you know, that, uh, that the, the ignorance and the hatred and the greed are, are going to be foils as it were, or, or fuel uh, for the work we need to do and, and for, for a cultivating of wisdom and compassion. So it sounds like quite a lot. Of, so the people that you're in your field are describing this moment in that way, a second axial age. And yeah, it, it, is it going to be, is this going to somehow um, lead humanity into a new state of consciousness and a new civilization or not, or don't we know, or is there going to be a lot of everything, good and evil? um as a result of this process how, how do you see this yeah yeah what unfolding <clears throat> i yeah i um well it, it depends you know there, there are moments and, and and in a way it's these these moments match i think uh my personality and probably you know human personality in general which is not as monolithic as we would like often like to think um you know i am i'm actually several people in this body, I mean, I don't suffer from multiple multiple personality disorder, but there are many centers of me, and some of them feel uh, are 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 you know locked in despair and panic at uh, at what feel what I feel is coming. Uh, others are still able, at least occasionally now, it's rare, uh, have some kind of hope that we can make it through and transition to what uh, some of my colleagues are calling ecological civilization. I know you're aware of, of the people that I'm talking about. Um, it's a beautiful, <clears throat> beautiful dream of rebirth of our civilization in a sustainable mode. Um, so the, these two coexist in me, uh, but if I'm honest with myself, the, the, the little island of hope, the, part of me or yeah the, the sub self that is still living on this little island of hope uh, is seeing this island shrink more and more and more uh, and um, so there's there's the island of despair which is growing but there's also another sort of I'm looking at least and sighting occasionally a mainland which is uh, which is be somewhere between or other than uh, hope and despair so a third way beyond hope and despair, which is not in a way is, is uh, suspending the question of whether or not we'll make it to some promised land or whether we can avert, um, uh, avert the, the catastrophe that, that you know, seems to be looming. And with that mainland in sight, um, do you feel motivation to engage in the world um, to either reduce harm or create joy um, is their motivation because you've talked about a form of hope which rests on a story of some kind of transformation you've also talked about a place of despair but is there this other place you've talked about where you suspend that question where does that leave you in terms of motivation to act mm. engage in the world Mm. Yeah, well, if I could, yeah, um, if I could speak sort of metaphorically, that again, this, 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 uh, the, the glimpses I've had of this mainland um, uh, is a place where all of our actions uh, don't simply disappear in, into a kind of the void of the past, but uh, are, are sort of eternally, eternally flowering plants as it were or 
there are, there are occasions that 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 uh, that keep on going as as it were. So what I do now and in in the next moment and what I did yesterday is not just gone. It's 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 somehow present eternally. So um, when I when I intuit that, I realize that wow the what I could do to, to ease suffering matters infinitely. It matters eternally. Uh, what I could do to bring forth love or joy or compassion matters in the moment, certainly. But one of the reasons why it matters in that moment is that it matters eternally. This is, this is an intuition that I have. Uh, or, or said otherwise, um, if we don't like to think in terms of eternity, uh, I, I believe that certain values like compassion, solidarity, love uh, are intrins have intrinsic value and in a sense, infinite value, regardless of how they turn out or regardless of, of yeah, what, what flows from them. Um, so in that sense, uh, yeah, I am motivated. Uh, I mean, I feel I'm falling short, of course, of what I feel I maybe could do or should do. But, so um, that, that for me is a wonderful and natural extension of the notion of there only being the present moment. Like, like there is no tomorrow because when, when it comes, it's today. Uh, and it's like an eternal, a sense of an eternal present. Hmm. Um, and I can see there's quite a lot of both ancient wisdom, but also contemporary physics that one can draw on to talk about that sense of an eternal present. and everything matters forever feeling um, and each action, each thought. So I'm, it's interesting then that um, with that in mind, what meaningful activism might look like today? Um, and there's quite a bit of discussion in the deep adaptation field generally and in the forums, platforms in particular about inner work versus outer work, if there is such a binary, um, and really, I think that plays into this idea of engaged spirituality. And, and it's sort of the, the rubber hits the road on this one. To the extent do we care about and prioritize social justice and not just helping each other feel a bit better with our fear, vulnerability, grief, but also how we help each other look at ourselves and our complicity and whether we can do more to reduce harm. Mm. Ease suffering, I think you said. Mm. So I was interested in, yeah, for you, what feels right uh, uh, for activism now, if you have a, an anticipation of collapse or you're witnessing collapse or beginning to experience it, what does activism mm. look like? Mm. Yeah, well, well, for this, I'm I'm uh, <clears throat> uh, always re-inspired by our our mutual beloved friend uh, Joanna Macy's reminder that in the uh, in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, there is no such thing as individual salvation, you know? uh, and, and this arises, of course, from the the insight and the experience of our radical interbeing that. Uh, that we we can only artificially draw a line or or cut the bonds that that uh, constitute each of us as in fact as a a, a single complex living being which um, you know which you could call the cosmos or more locally we could call it this living planet or humanity wherever you want to uh, draw that sort of boundary so. Uh, you know, if, if in fact that is true, and I can only speak from my own you know, experience that I have experienced it as true, then uh, it, it, I can't work on my own enlightenment or salvation or, or awakening uh, without simultaneously uh, caring for and acting on behalf of the other uh, whose suffering I behold. And um, so that, yeah, and, and of course, this is why you know wisdom and compassion always go together, or in the Christian tradition, um, works and and grace. 
So uh, yeah, to me, it's, it's just inconceivable to, to not be active uh, on behalf of our brothers and sisters, human, especially of course, but also other than human. Um, it's inconceivable. And, and if I see somebody's engaged in, in a, on a path that, um, that does not recognize that, I, I see it as delusion. I, I try to see it with compassion as well, but it's a form of delusion to me. And you live in California, and I, I know that um, Michel Foucault, the sociologist, wrote about the Californian cult of the self, mm. uh, and sort of almost like a hyper-individualist reworking of ancient wisdom and spirit spiritual traditions where the bliss-seeking uh, and the self-actualization those parts remain, um, but not this engaged compassion uh, mm -hmm. as much. And I'm wondering, um, is that is that something you're seeing the same as before or more of? And what do we do? You call it out. I think you just said that you wouldn't. You see it as delusion, and you forgive it. You're compassionate to it, and is there anything that we, we we can do to invite people to be and practicing a more engaged spirituality at, mm. as things get more difficult? Mm. Well, I am encouraged to see that at least in um, the students who come to uh, the program where I've been teaching for the last 23 years, um, the philosophy, cosmology and consciousness program, <clears throat> that um, you know, the, the students have always been uh, interested in inner transformation and in expansion of consciousness, mm -hmm. but they are all uh, now very aware of the the existential threat that we face. I mean, they were generally before, but now it's like universal. They are all uh, um, committed to social justice, social mm -hmm. transformation. They're, they're quite radical politically, most of them, not, not universally, but uh, so I'm encouraged that, that all, all of the people that I see now uh, in, in the Bay Area, not all, but more and more who are committed to and interested in personal transformation and spirituality are simultaneously aware of and committed to uh, transformation in the social and political realm. Um, mm. Of course, they, they tend to think that the way to do that is through transformation of consciousness. They, they're, they tend to be more introverted in that sense, and focusing on worldviews. But, it, but it's encouraging, I think. So, um, right. You know, there are exceptions. There are, I, I occasionally meet people who are convinced that all we need to do is change our worldview or change our consciousness. And, um, yes, change you know. our attention, the whole law of attraction idea. That yeah. we manifest what we focus on and therefore if we're worried about climate change and collapse we're making it happen um how do you respond yeah um well if, if they're saying as uh richard tarnas my colleague here in the program likes to say worldviews create worlds and uh i believe that in our program is actually that's one of the premises of our program. And you know, I, I think it's true. Worldviews do create worlds. And however, worlds create worldviews. Uh, we, we know that, that people, people's minds, personalities and behaviors are conditioned and structured by the real relations, uh, social, political, economic relations that they're born into and are embedded within. So um, we need to work simultaneously on, on uh, transforming the world that we're in, acting in the world as we work on our consciousness. The two are, to separate the two is itself a form of delusion once again. Um, so that's mm. sort of how I approach it. But yeah, I don't have much sympathy for law of attraction kind of discourse. Uh, you know, I, I see, I see, I understand it and I can see how for some people, it's maybe therapeutic to, uh, to um, focus on the good and the positive. I mean, we know that medically that there are some people 
William James studied this uh, over a century ago in the varieties of religious experience where he talked about two types of personality and spirituality, the healthy minded, he called it, and, and the sick soul. The healthy minded at the time, he was looking at the whole new thought movement in the United States, which was really the precursor of the new age movement. So there's a long tradition, particularly in this country, of uh, this idea that our consciousness uh, creates reality. And um, you know, for some people that attitude actually works in terms of let's say physical health or, or, um, or psychological mood and so on. So there is therapeutic value to it. And it can become a form of delusion and denial uh, in, in the social context, I think. Yeah, if it leads to people to think that the poor are poor because they haven't self-actualized or, um, and then they start to ignore structural prejudice and oppression and so forth. Exactly. Yeah, thank you, Sean. So I'm just gonna say, uh, we, we do welcome questions um, uh, for Sean. Please uh, send them to um, Matthew, who's named himself questions here, please. And um, I will select some. We're gonna have a question from Sandra in a minute, but just to give you a moment, Sandra. Um, Sean, can you tell us what the main, um, the main message of your latest book is and uh, tell us the title so we know what where to look for it okay <clears throat> yeah well the title is uh becoming gaia and the subtitle uh is on the threshold of planetary initiation um yeah that's so that's the title it should be out uh actually next month with any luck uh there might be an announcement before then hopefully on the solstice um and, you know, it is um, the theme, I guess, is the one that we've been talking about, uh, uh, second axial age, you might say, the nature of a second axial age, uh, around the core idea of a transformation, not only of human consciousness, but of the, the, the layer of consciousness of Gaia or the earth uh, itself, Gaia herself. I mean, the Gaia has not only has a kind of geosphere of the, the hard elements and the biosphere um, and an atmosphere, but it also has a thought sphere or a consciousness sphere, a noosphere, as Teilhard de Chardin called it. And this noosphere of the planet is undergoing a, a radical transformation in, in the form of a of turning in from, from consciousness to self-consciousness. So Gaia herself is awakening to herself um, through the human is the basic idea. Now, and I believe that Gaia ha has her own sentience, her own soul nature that was there prior to the human uh, and in a sense will always be there. But, but the human that has evolved out of Gaia, human is not other than Gaia, human is just a, a mode of Gaia. So through uh, the human, Gaia is waking up to herself. Uh, and that's the other side of the humans waking up, possibly at least, potentially, humans are waking up to themselves as uh, members of this living planet that we call Gaia. So that's the main theme. <laughs> The other part is that uh, this waking up is happening as and by means of an initiation, which involves, like all initiations, a near-death experience uh, and um, a collective or planetary near-death experience. And that it may very well be that the initiation will not succeed unless, uh, well, first of all, we don't know what success means. Uh, and I don't mean that the that everything will be all right and we'll transition to an ecological civilization. But if the transformation of consciousness is to succeed, it may very well be like in all initiations that enough of us need to really open ourselves fully to uh, the presence of death and, and what it means for, for the transformation to happen. So anyway, that's the main theme. I'm wondering, it, it sounds to like it resonates with the work of Thomas Berry and uh, also the, the movement that calls itself conscious 
evolution. Um, would you would you say that it does, or are there some distinctions in how you see uh, this? It, it definitely resonates with. Uh, so Thomas Berry, uh, who um, you know, collaborated for many years with uh, Brian Swim, uh, who is a, a dear friend and colleague in the same program where I teach. Yeah, I draw from their work uh, in this book. I guess the difference would be that um, at least Thomas and Brian, to a certain extent, although I think it's maybe changing, believed that um, that there was still a real fighting chance that we could transition to what they called an ecozoic civilization, was their term for an ecological civilization. Um, I'm not, you know, part of me feels that that's not going to happen. The third way is that I'm suspending altogether the question of whether or not that can happen and just focusing on what needs to be done and what, what, is, uh, uh, what is worthwhile doing uh, now, what we need to do regardless of outcome. So there's that difference with, with Thomas and possibly with Brian. The conscious evolution, yeah, uh, although I believe my sense is that the conscious evolution people are still pretty much... Uh, uh, at least until recently, have been committed to this idea of also a greater probability of some kind of successful transition to a to uh, a new world, uh, and um, perhaps also a greater emphasis on the positive nature of like the nature of positive thinking. Mm. I, I, I see. Yeah. You, what's your What's your sense, Jim? Um. My simple answer is, I don't know. I do think that it sounds like it's it's maintaining a form of anthropocentrism, yet also embracing into being. So um, I just don't know whether we're so special. Mm. I mean, according to our brain power and the way we understand life, then clearly we are particular, uh, unique, it seems. But I've reached that point of, of not really knowing. And I, and I wonder whether there might be a bit less, you know, what might come from a full of embrace of the idea um, that we're nothing particularly special, like we're not some higher stage of consciousness of Gaia understanding itself. And I don't argue that because I just don't know. But... Um, I find that interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's such an important question. <clears throat> yeah, and, you know, of course, there's no way of proving any of this. Uh, but, you know, one thing seems clear is that whatever we believe around that question, it is humans, uh, our human behavior and our presence on the planet, which is determining the fate of all other species on the planet. Uh, and, um, you know, it's the whole idea of the Anthropocene. So we, all of us now are the first humans ever to live in the birth of a new geological age. I mean, we have to try to take that in. We humans now, us in this virtual room, are the first humans ever to live during the birth of a new geological age. And, and not that many species get through a shift in the, what, the geological no. age. <laughs> no, that's right. That's and the thing is, is them out. yeah, and this new geological age, the name of it is the age of the human, the Anthropocene. Okay. Yeah, but we, we came up with that, though. <laughs> <So> <laughs> that's right. I but, I bet, but I bet you the dolphins and all the other our, our, uh -huh. our siblings are probably saying, yeah, you know, this, this is their moment. And I wonder what they're going to do with it sort of thing, right. because, because we're, what, what they do uh, is going to determine our fate. So willy-nilly, we live in, in the age of, of where human agency has become a planetary, as, as you know, yeah. Thomas Berry and Brian Swim say, a macro phase uh, I quite, power. Mm -hmm. I quite like the idea that the, we're living in an age that whatever an intelligent species that decides to label periods of geological history, whatever they decide to call this, it will be related to there being a lot of radioactive waste and plastic in this in this part of the, the geological record. So um, I'm, I'm um, going to ask Sandra to uh, ask a question of Sean. 
And also, if you could say, unmute yourself, please, Sandra, and also say where you're, where you're joining us from. Uh, and ask after Sandra uh, Taum has a question. I'm not hearing anything, Sandra, you need to unmute. You're still not unmuting. Um, I can't, oh, there we go. Yeah, well, you're here with us. Hello. I'm uh, speaking from Zagreb in Croatia. Um, a long, long years I did uh, try to enter into the different aspects of uh, teaching of esoteric, let's say, Islam through the Sufi uh, teaching and through Christians teachings and through let's say with this teaching i'm familiar and uh, the question which i would like to ask not to enter too much into that uh, very deep and uh, special field is uh, what do you how do you feel the place in this particular moment when we are now humans uh, where is the place of the rituals mm. for example today is uh, saint lucia saint sveta lucia I don't know, I'm sure you know uh, that it's a uh, luce is light, so it's a celebration of light. Uh, and it can be seen that symbol in many levels as a folklore or as an incredibly deep uh, link with the world of symbols and uh, which lead us to the more subtle capacities if we did cultivate it. So I did put seed, do you say seeds from what we do bread? What's the name of the jito? I'm not sure what the oh, English. Dough? No, no, uh, kernels or what? Seeds, seeds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seeds. seeds. And so it's, it's a ritual and it will, it will grow 12 days till uh, Noel, what's the name of Christmas. And if, if right. the, each day will represent one month. So there is some kind of projection spiritually possible. And I would like to know, what do you think about rituals? Right. Well, um, I think they're, they hold great power and it's, uh, it's, um, tragic that so many people have lost any connection with living ritual traditions. Uh, I mean, I remember how powerful the, the Catholic mass was to me as a child, uh, for instance. And um, you know, since then, I've, I've been able to experience many other kinds of ritual. And you know, we, we, need, uh, we need to rethink some of the old, older rituals um, and create new ones. You know, uh, for instance, uh, Joanna Macy and Matthew Fox once at uh, Findhorn College over Easter did a uh, reinvented or created a new ritual with the stations of the cross, but where each station of the cross was a, a, uh, uh, an embodiment of the suffering of some aspect of our living earth, you know, some animals suffering. And, and, and so there was a procession you could walk together with your, uh, with other people, embodied and and uh, pay witness to and suffer with uh, the rest of the beings uh, on our on our living earth, and so this this was a way of rethinking the archetypal theme of of the passion that Christians suffer, uh, celebrate uh, at Easter. So the suffering of the God and, and its rebirth. So there are many possibilities for rethinking, reimagining the older rituals. And of course, um, there are many rituals we can draw from, from uh, earth-based traditions, from indigenous traditions, and they're being created all the time. So yes, it's very important. And I, I, uh, um, I need more of it in my own life, actually. I, what rituals do you have in your own life at the moment? Yeah, well, I mean, my my I guess my my own rituals are sort of my daily practice in the park, where I you know I, I practice uh, Chinese internal martial arts uh, you know, and uh, 
and a standing, a form of standing qigong and so on, uh, which is ritual, it's ritualized. And I, right. but um, yeah, I don't have that many. I mean, I, I occasionally go to, uh, to uh, very occasionally now, hardly at all, but to uh, Christian, Catholic or Anglican masses, because that ritual is still very meaningful to me. Um, some, you know, some, I mean, there are rituals we do in, in the work that reconnects. Um, there's, you know, the council of all beings, there's a building a cairn of mourning. There are, there are different rituals that we, we do in that context, but um, not enough. I need more, more ritual <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, so I think I might have a ritual of uh, just picking up my phone and going on the deep adaptation Facebook group like every day. I, I don't, but I don't know if that counts as a <laughs> practice. Um, <laughs> it's really a negative ritual. Uh, uh, or actually just a, an addiction that I need to do something about. Um, <laughs> but, uh, all right, we have a question from, um, from, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Taum. Tell us where, how to pronounce it and where you're, where you're speaking from. And you've, it looks like you've got a few questions or comments. Please just choose one. Thanks. And They're all yourself. related, so I'll, I'll try to put it into one. So um, on Facebook I, and other places, I've connected with a number of groups. But the one I'm most fascinated with the last week or so are the glass bead game people. And mm -hmm. some came to talk to my um, media shamans group. And basically what they did, they just started off after we did a check-in with speaking as if they were from 40 years in the future, 10 years in the future, just speaking as if they were. So the first person Kaas said, oh, so interesting. So this is the kind of group <clears throat> that spawned what changed the world and created what we have now. Um, because it seems like it's crucial, going back to some of what you were saying, Sean, that people have not an unrealistic, oh, everyone's gonna reach integral level and it'll all be fine, but that they need, instead of the zombie movies and the apocalyptic movies, they need visions of, of what really is possible from here, realistically. And, and that ties in with the Jean Gebser, um, I think, idea of ever-present origin, that future, past, and present are all enfolded in the future influences us and we influence it mm. so that this is one way to consciously do that um, and it's play you know that's why that one group is the glass bead game because it's play and play is crucial mm. interesting yeah what's your thoughts on that sean yeah well thank you uh yeah first of all i love the glass bead game I, um but in terms of uh the um the exercise you're, you're speaking of. I was introduced to that through Joanna Macy in the work that reconnects where uh, it's a key part of the work uh, and where we get, as Joanna puts it, we get to exercise our moral imagination uh, in a playful but si simultaneously serious way, a playfully serious or a seriously playful way where we allow ourselves to, uh, yeah, to, um, or we allow the future beings to speak through us by simply um, allowing that it may be so, right? So we, we suspend the, the critical mind uh, and um, uh, allow that to happen. So yeah, it's crucial, it's crucial. And um, especially if we can truly suspend any expectation of what that future might might be, uh, and possibly recognize that you know there there are multiple futures. Uh, if if you want to think of uh, of uh, you know be inspired by contemporary physics uh, or not, and to allow any one of these multiple futures to speak to us, because we don't know which one we need to hear from the most. Uh, so um, yeah, just allow them to speak. So, mm. so yeah, I wasn't aware that there were other groups doing this, but um, if, if you haven't already, you might want to, to uh, check out uh, Joanna's work and, and the work that reconnects where that's a, a central part of, uh, of, of the practice and the rituals we do together. 
yeah, I found it very helpful and have integrated some of the work that reconnects in my own teaching and, and facilitation on deep adaptation. Uh, we have a question from Jill in Ambleside, who actually attended one of the retreats um, I did in England. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, I was just thinking that you both, you, Jim, and you, Sean, you have a, um, in a way, a public platform. And um, what I wondered when you talk about changing consciousness and so on, in my world, I find if I don't go on deep adaptation every day, um, I find very few people that I can speak to about this. Uh, very few people who are anticipating collapse. Very few people who have any glimpse of that at all. And I find myself, even in relation to my own sons who have small children, I find myself very reluctant to, to speak about this or to put it forward. Um, so I was just wondering how you, or either of you, um, meet this, what to me is a, is a dilemma. Uh, I, I feel my lack of courage. I feel my protectiveness towards other people. I, 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 I suppose sometimes I doubt their ability to shoulder this or to face it, or I don't know if they have the resources. I take, I find myself taking on that decision um, in place of them in a way. And then it feels to me that I lack courage in some way. So I'm really interested to hear uh, what your experience is on a personal level when you don't have a public platform, when you're not putting out a paper or lecturing to students, you know, that would be my Nice. Did you want to go ahead, Jen, and, and respond? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to too, but I'm, I'm also... No, no, I mean, thank you, Jill, for including me in the question, but, but I, 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 it's a question for Sean, and then I'll comment after. Okay. Well, yes, Jill, thank you for that. Um, you know, it, it's it's hard. It's somewhat. It sounds like uh, you're in the situation of uh, the ancient mariner, if you know that that uh, poem. Probably my favorite poem in the English language. Um, you know, and we're reluctant to grab the young person on their way to the wedding feast, <laughs> who who's only hearing uh, the music playing in the background, uh, to grab them and say, you know there was a ship and, and to tell them this tale. Um, but uh, we feel compelled to. There's, there's no way out of this dilemma really, except uh, at least in my experience, um, I've learned to, uh, to recognize when it's not helpful for one to, to, to bring it up. If somebody is simply doesn't have the resources if, 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 if you sense they're just going to fall into dissociation, uh, for instance, then it's probably not helpful to, to share it with them. But there may be times where you sense that it's worth the risk. And um, so in other words, it's, it's a question of, of discernment and of skillful means of whether to bring it up and uh, if so, how to bring it up. But in the cases where it sounds like you just don't have the the opportunity to bring it up, then uh, thankfully there is something like the deep adaptation uh, community where at least uh, virtually we can be in touch and support each other. Um, no, I don't know what more to say other than I, 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 uh, I feel with you, I hear you. And I, I, I'm, I too have been a voice crying in the wilderness for, for many years, but um, there are less there are more and more of us now. So um, hopefully you're feeling more community than, than you were even a while ago. Yeah, thanks for that, Sean. Um, uh, in my own life, uh, I, I need a break from this work and the emotional toll uh, 
of of holding other people in their turning towards this and the the shock and the grief and the fear so for my own mental well-being i'm not telling everyone i know about my perspective on the future or the near future or the work i do um, however i don't hide it either so if they ask me i say or if they've seen something on my facebook wall and they ask me i tell them um, but yeah i've i've um and i think what sean said as well i realized that um if some people don't don't have the um a support or support around them to talk and engage then um just this this, informa this information can't really fit um in, in their in their world view but also in their daily life their daily media diet and their conversations with people they, they just so um so I, I, it's for me, it's still an open question about how do we invite more people to um, consider the outlook that many of us share, um, with with all while also looking out, looking out after ourselves, because because it, it it is, you know, you want to be fully present to someone else's pain if you're bringing them such difficult information. Otherwise, you're just being numb or callous. And you don't want to do that, so therefore it's a big thing. So we've got to be careful looking after ourselves as well. Um, so we have time for just one last question. Um, Jay, uh, please unmute yourself. Oh, you are unmuted. Well done. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. It's been a joy today. Um, my question is about consciousness. Um, from childhood, really, I felt the need to advocate for looking at um, the world um, with an appreciation of consciousnesses other than our own, particularly animals. But Sean, your comments about, um, you know, remembering to contextualise our experience in terms of Gaia, I, I was I really welcome that reminder. Um, it feels to me very much that our um quick and ready assumption that our consciousness is superior you know people always so quick to say um we're at the top of the the kind of pyramid in terms of animal consciousness i would gently question that i would say oh really um i mean yes we can do lots of scientific experiments of the behavior of animals and see how we can you know give them various stimuli and see how they respond but we can barely understand human consciousness as well as I hope we want one day can. So how then can we jump to this massive conclusion that our consciousness is superior and how can we possibly hope to appreciate what the consciousness of a non-human animal or a tree is? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, for example, of tree communities where tree, tree communities know when a tree is sick and they re nutrients. Um, so I guess my question is, you know, in light of the fact, I, I, I believe that this perception is part, partly what has got us to the, the problems that we're experiencing today, this kind of arrogant assumption of superiority. So I guess my question is, any thoughts on, um, on that, the, the extent to which... That's good. Uh, Jay, Jay, we've only got a minute. So, okay. So that, I think, it's, it's, I think, it's I think you get the idea. Question. Yes. Absolutely, important question. Thank you. Yeah. Sean, it, it's a great question. It's a great question, Jay. Thank you for that. Well, first of all, I would say that, um, you know, we are animals. Uh, we are not other than animals. We are Gaia. We are not other than Gaia. Uh, I, I would say that. Um, and... Um, I, I'm totally with you that uh, anthropocentrism, but I would say a malignant anthropocentrism is at the root of, 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 our, of Gaia's ills. Um, but I feel that there's another kind of anthropocentrism. I mean, dolphins are dolphin-centric. We cannot help but be anthropocentric. We, we 
we are Gaia from the point of view of, of human consciousness. And I, so for me, uh, the question is how can I, how can I deepen into my guy anthropic as I call it? So I, I prefer the idea of a guy Anthropocene instead of the Anthropocene. So where the human, the human potential is precisely that to awaken to itself as a living member of Gaia. Uh, and, um, you know, one of the, the, the signs of that potential is that humans can, they don't always, but they can care for and mourn, let's say, the passing of a whole species. We don't know that other animals do that. I mean, we know that elephants mourn the passing of their own, their own uh, species. We know that dogs and other animals mourn other beings, but, but humans have the potential at least imperfectly realized it's true to care for the whole community of being and actually to put that whole community above their own welfare right uh we haven't done that yet but i but i see that as the real potential the deeper potential of of the human as a as a true member of gaia but thank you for that that question yeah thank you jay and thanks for the answer sean so Sean, we've come to the the end, and I just want to say it was um, uh, for over fourteen months ago. I think you agreed to do this Q and A, and that was because we put them together as a series, uh, which we launched during a Deep Adaptation Forum crowdfund. Um, and so we've now come to the end of that that series. So, Sean, thank you for agreeing to that, um, and for your support in general for the Deep Adaptation Forum. Um, for those of you who want to support the forum, it, it exi it's grown since then uh, and has a core team of about four or five people and hundreds of volunteers. Many of you on the call are volunteers uh, and it seeks to provide lots of support and conversation of all kinds, all for free. So um, please, uh, if you go to deepadaptation.info, there's a new website for the forum and you can also find a Patreon link if you feel moved to support it. Um, I'm no longer working with the core team and um, uh, but I'm participating as Sean is on what's called the holding group, uh, 14 of us um, that provide, provide sort of strategic uh, support for the core team. So uh, that's the end of my series of Q and A's for the Deep Adaptation Forum and uh, we'll see we'll see what happens next if you're interested in the ones in the past um go to my youtube channel um so just type my name jen bendel into youtube and you'll see it's quite a lot now probably over 18 maybe 20 interviews so sean it was a lovely way to finish this series of q a's okay. um, so thank you very much thank, thank you it was my honor and thank you all for coming today <laughs> Thank bye -bye. you, everybody. Um, and bye-bye. Uh, yeah, be well. <laughs>